summer, about a year ago today, I was in Sun Valley, Idaho, and had purchased lawn seats for a benefit concert at an outdoor venue. We got there early for a good spot, and it rained heavily for an hour and a half. So we sat there huddled under our umbrellas. The orchestra started playing, and the feature artist stepped on stage. At the moment she started to sing, the rain stopped, the clouds parted, and the sun came through. It was an absolutely amazing performance. I would never have thought that one year later, I would have the honor of introducing that artist at the Tessitura Conference. Renee Fleming, world-renowned soprano, is a four-time Grammy Award winner and has been awarded the National Medal of Artists, National Medal of Arts, the highest honor for an individual artist in the United States. 111 million viewers saw her perform at the 2014 Super Bowl. She has performed at hundreds of Tessitura-powered venues. As a matter of fact, five of the six next organizations she is performing with are Tessitura venues in Australia, New Zealand, and North America. When I mentioned that to her, she said, oh, I just assume they all are. <laughs> Beyond her extensive performance career, she is a creative consultant for the Lyric Opera of Chicago and continues to build on an already substantial role as a visionary leader and cultural ambassador. It is through Renee's reputation as a thought leader that she came to the attention of Kristen Olson, our Tessitura's Director of Learning Resources and Curator of the Tessitura Innovator Series. Kristen had the vision to invite Renee to speak at TLCC, and we owe many thanks to Lisa Middleton of the Lyric Opera of Chicago, who helped make that dream a reality. And now, it is my pleasure to welcome Renee Fleming to TLCC 2015. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, just kidding. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> oh, I'm so thrilled to be here. Um, having only attended two events so far, I already feel like I've been invited into this incredibly illustrious uh, club. It's like behind the wizard's door. And you have to understand, for a singer, Tessitura is the bane of our existence. <laughs> and I'm not talking about the software. I'm talking about the prevailing pitch or mean pitch of any given section, page, or piece. And it's always too high or too low. And for a soprano, and for my voice type in particular, there might be five pieces in the entire repertoire that actually suit my voice. So, um, however, <clears throat> never mind. <laughs> so, for the real, I mean, I don't have to tell you how much technology has changed our lives as performers. It's, it's been incredible. And I couldn't help but remember yesterday how much time I've spent over the years thinking about the audience. Who is the audience? What do they like? What do they want all over the world, whether it's China or Australia or the US or anywhere that I go? I mean, are they, do they want Strauss? Do they want Berg? Should I program something like Messiaen du Tilleux? Or do they, can I only sing the famous Italian opera here with a sprinkling of Rodgers and Hammerstein in summertime? So it, it's, it's been an incredible guessing game, and even Universal, DECA, that I've had a, a contract, a recording contract, made so many recordings with them over 20 years, and every time we plan a record, I say, what's the market for this? Well, we don't really know, because there are, there's no metrics for this, there's no data, there's no real, real knowledge of, beyond certain countries, of what the sales issues or, or, or um, a, a real data is. So Tessitura, what I'm saying is, where have you been all my life? 
I mean, this would have been incredibly helpful to me, and it will be as you grow and gain in, in expertise, you are going to give so much to the performing arts and to all of the arts. It's, it's going to be so helpful. So despite all of that, I have really tried to extend my audience when I've had the chance because it's so important. And there have been a lot of changes, so let me share some thoughts for you. I mean, first of all, we are now under tremendous pressure to look like the characters that we're playing. So in my case, that's been girls between the age of 15 and 23, <laughs> always on the verge of death and destruction. <laughs> and let me tell you, it's become a challenge. And HD doesn't make it any easier. So. However, we need soul food, we need this. And one of the other issues that's come up more recently, and I've seen this with my own younger relatives, is that people aren't really going out much at all anymore. They're staying home, watching high quality television, cable, and the internet for very little money or for free. Um, younger people are watching YouTube and Vine rather than listening to music. However, it's been proven now that there is a sense of malaise, of isolation, of loneliness that goes with that. And I think that we can provide a community for people. There's also in a kind of secular world this, this desire to share things. And not only can we provide this sense of community, but we can provide a place where people can be reminded of what the historic context is for what we read in the paper, for the tragic occurrences that exist in our world today. Geez, you know what? This went on hundreds of years ago, and it's in this handle aria and this opera that you're going to find all of this, and in this museum that you're going to be reminded of what the history of mankind is. So if there's room for discussion, it's helpful. And one of the other things I love to do is research psychology, neuroscience, happiness. A lot of books on happiness right now. And one of the interesting and most important elements is novelty. Who would have thought it? But we can provide that for our own audiences by giving them unusual experiences, unconventional experience is not what they expect every day and we can also draw new audiences with these same unconventional experiences so in my role i'm trying to be a change agent and we can do this for the art form uh, we need to make it a lifestyle choice by adding friends food wine if our work doesn't become cool glamorous and desirable for my generation and younger, there won't be a next generation of funders to support our extremely expensive art form. So who's getting this right? It worked really well for the Grateful Dead. <laughs> I went, trust me, I've never been to a stadium concert in my life. I'd never been to a Grateful Dead concert but I went to Soldier Field for one of their farewell concerts, and I saw 50,000 people, not in the stadium, that was 70,000. 50,000 people were outside, walking around, buying tie-dye t-shirts. <laughs> in the hotel at the Ritz-Carlton, I got in the elevator, there were four generations, from grandfather to baby in the stroller, also in tie-dye t-shirts. <laughs> And you know they put on their business suits when they went home the next day, and I just thought, wow, this is lifestyle. This is really working and has worked. Uh, I, I want to share a little bit with you now about what we're doing at Lyric Opera of Chicago. So in 2010, when Lyric Opera was having the challenge, an economic challenge that most other arts organizations were having, Chairman Dick Kiphart called me in New York and said, I'd like to come to New York and take you out to lunch. And I thought, wow, okay, wow, that's interesting. And he came and he said, we're thinking we'd like to have you connect to Lyric Opera administratively. So shock, shock and awe. I said, my goodness, I, it's not like I was looking for anything to do. <laughs> I, I, uh, I can't even keep up with my own performance schedule. 
Uh, uh, so, but you know, it was intriguing because it never crossed my mind and I had some months to really think and contemplate and wonder, do I have anything to offer? Do I have any opinions? Can I give back in this way? Can I share in my experience? I've traveled a lot. I've seen a lot of best practices all over the world. And so ultimately the answer was yes. And thus was born the first creative consultant for Lyric Opera of Chicago. So we met, we put together a long list of, uh, I put together you know, a long creative list of initiatives and we came up with what seemed practical and possible. And I knew I couldn't be on the ground because I'm still performing uh, a lot and therefore I couldn't easily contribute to what was on stage because that would require a summer tour of seeing singers, conductors, and uh, productions. I would love to do that, but I'm performing. So uh, what I really was passionate about was audience development, how to get people in the doors, trying it at least. Uh, I also discovered that a huge advantage was being on the executive board of the institution because then I could see and learn about the inner workings and be supportive of the administration with the board. So I happen to consider Chicago one of the great cultural cities of the world. And one of the first things I thought, first initiative, exactly, was let's band together. Let's collaborate with other great institutions and get the message out and make this a destination city. I'm a culture freak, so anywhere I go, what do you like to do in your day off? Oh, go to the museums, go to theater. I like to do other cultural things. So, of course, I thought that it would be along those lines that we would begin to forge relationships, but actually, it was something quite different. On an off night, I had uh, uh, the chance to go see Second City. And um, my husband and I went because my children loved it and I'd seen these incredibly talented young comedians go from Second City to Saturday Night Live and then to stardom in film. And um, so we walked in, you know, it's very casual. I was completely overdressed, trying <laughs> really hard to keep my purse and shoes off the beer soaked floor and table like this. But you know, laughing and halfway through the second half, I couldn't believe what I heard. I'm elbowing my husband. I said, Tim, Tim, that's my voice. And this wasn't, this wasn't summertime or something popular. It was an obscure handle aria. And I couldn't believe it. So I'm looking around and I see in the corner a music director who's making all sound effects, playing all the music, clearly directed everything. Young guy, tussled hair. So at the end of the show, I make a beeline for him and I say, I'm Renee Fleming. <laughs> so first he laughed and then he realized I wasn't kidding. And then he looked absolutely terrified. <laughs> and I was nice. I didn't say my husband's an attorney. <laughs> I, said, I said, no, I'm not going to yell at you for copyright infringement. I want to work with you. Because you know, he was the music director. He, he wrote the whole thing. He said, yes, my aunt gave me your CD. So <laughs> we had a blast. And you know, the, the one thing that our mainstream prizes right now above anything else is celebrity. So I have reached out in, in the last five years to a lot of my friends and Sir Patrick Stewart, who's a huge opera fan and it wasn't at that time widely known how deeply funny he is. I said, would you like to collaborate with us in Second City? And he said, yes, it was a miracle. And he, so we had a wonderful time putting this together, although I was nervous about sort of doing, making fun of the opera with, and these, and these fabulous actors are also singing, but not operatically, you can imagine. So the first table read, will this work? Have a look.
tell a lot about an opera based on who it's by. If it's Rossini, this overture will last for another 20 minutes. If it's fairly be born, a whole lot of us will die. If it's Wagner, a lot of us will die, but you won't really mind it. <laughs> I feel like when a guy sets up a first date, it's usually something like really fast that he can get out of, like coffee or something. Ugh. So, uh, I don't even know, what are we seeing? The ring cycle. <laughs> holy crap, holy crap, it's 11 o'clock, 11 o'clock, and it's only intermission. I have to pee, I really have to pee. But the line is long, and I have to make it back before Act 3. Musical theorist, composer, and stand-up comedian, Arnold Schoenberg! You guys are all like, Turan, don't make fun of Puccini, or we'll Tosca you off the stage. <laughs> the war is over, the lovers are wed, unless, of course, they've killed themselves. <laughs> Let's go to Opera Land. To Opera Land. To Opera Land. And you can find your opera anywhere. So let's all go to Opera Land. We'll see you Well, it was sold out. They had to cover the pit in order to accommodate more seats, and it received two Jeff Awards, including Best Production for a Review. A few months later, we brought it back, put it on stage in a cabaret setting, and had drinks, and people actually looked at the stage and also saw the entire house in the background. And best of all, 35% of ticket buyers were new to the Opera House. So as it happened, Second City was involved in another of our new initiatives. It was a brand new marketing campaign called Long Live Passion. So you felt as a child that your parents didn't protect you. From what? That witch. Oh, here we go. Gretel, let Hansel finish. And by which do you mean your mother? No, I mean a literal witch who abducted us, put a spell on us, and tried to eat us. Gretel, is that how you remember it? Yes, I mean, we killed her, we baked her in a cake, and then we ate her, and then we freed dozens of children who had been enslaved as gingerbread zombies. That all happened. But I'm not gonna be defined by that one incident. Mimi, last week you were saying how you didn't feel as close to Rodolfo as you once did. When we first met, it was magic. Love at first sight. He lit my candle. Is that a euphemism? No, he literally lit my <laughs> You seriously need to get that cough checked out. And you seriously need to get off my back. He acts like I'm gonna die or something. Next, please. Baldi, I started learning when I was about 11 years old. <laughs> yeah, I know. It is, it's completely wrong. I had no idea what it was about, but I loved the music. And that's the thing, I think, that draws people to Puccini's repertoire is, first and foremost, the tunes, but then this pathos in this role. I mean, the heartbreak of this story, you cannot sit through Madame Butterfly and not be moved. <laughs> Fleming's the creative consultant for the Lyric Opera of Chicago. We were so excited when she arranged a special visit for us. 
The Lyric Opera House is beautiful. I had never been in it before. Such an amazing Art Deco building. You need to see it. The house is huge, red velvet, gold, very elegant. It's like a piece of art. It's cool to like, see how they put the set together, like you never see that. Yeah. I think she wanted to bring us here to see the inner workings of how an opera goes on, how a set goes on stage, and see how a costume is built to give us insight and appreciate it more. To be honest, I enjoy the view from the audience but I think I enjoy the view better on stage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so cute. You may have recognized our Gretel in the video, A.D. Bryant, who's, who's gone on to star in Saturday Night Live now. Um, also on our list was the world premiere. The current buzz is that great grand opera sells, but also so do new works. People are interested in experiencing something new. So we want to define something that's relevant, that reflects our growing and changing demographic. And Bel Canto, this novel, very successful novel by another friend of mine, um, novelist Ann Patchett, uh, is something that I thought, you know, it would be really wonderful if, if we could make that into an opera. Now, typically and historically, one hires a composer who puts together the creative team and the idea. And in this case, I said, I went to, to Sir Andrew and to Anthony Freud and said, can't we say we're going to produce Bel Canto and then find the composer who fits it, who's willing to take it on? So we tried that, and I made, uh, I did a tremendous amount of research, presented Sir Andrew with a short list, and we came up with wonderful Peruvian composer, Jimmy Lopez, and he uh, wanted to work with a fabulous Pulitzer Prize winning playwright, Nilo Cruz. And um, uh, it's going to be a, a premiered on December 7th, uh, I'm so excited that this has come together, and it's a fabulous vehicle also for soprano Danielle Denise. I've been the den mother and the curator of this project, and one, your colleague, Lisa Middleton, is uh, reaching out to book clubs around the country because Ann Patchett is the poster child for independent bookstores, so she's enormously popular even beyond her great um, novels. So we're always trying to think about how to broaden the appeal and draw people from elsewhere. So here's something about Bel Canto. I wanted to write a book about how art becomes the language, uh, the way that people can communicate when language is suspended, because it is a truly international party there is no common language among the guests. So for a while, the very busy translator tries to take care of things, and then it falls to the soprano, who really elevates them. The people find their best selves in this isolation. The award-winning Peruvian composer, Jimmy Lopez, who will create the music. Music comes to unite everyone under this very, very strenuous circumstances. Um, so in the first place, there's an opera right there. I mean, music takes center stage from page number one. Um, the other thing is the psychological aspect of how these, uh, the hostages and the captors um, connect to each other. And here we see an inverted Stockholm syndrome, and we have the captors falling in love with the hostages and vice versa. So you have this uh, very intricate human relationships developing under this very unlikely and very, very tough uh, situation. Um, and of course, uh, being based on real events, uh, which I witnessed when I was 18 years old, uh, it had a very direct personal connection to me and to my own experience. So what about the next generation? Tomorrow, actual tomorrow, <laughs> we have a premiere of an opera called Second Nature. It's designed for children aged seven through 12, and it will actually premiere at the Lincoln Park Zoo, and will be shown in 15 different unconventional locations around Chicago. Young audiences 
by young composer Matt O'Coin. I met Matt when my daughter uh, performed in an opera that he had composed, written a libretto for, conducted, orchestrated, probably directed it as well. Uh, and I thought, oh my gosh, this is going to be a nightmare. He was 19 years old. I knew it was going to be long, and it was phenomenal. And he has since taken the music world by absolute storm. Um, if you haven't already heard of him, you just can Google him, but he's brilliant. Uh, the next initiative is an annual commitment to the American Music Theater. Why? Opera is really a Western European art form at heart. We love it, we've embraced it, and there's great American opera as well. But there's also other music that has been born in this country. Popular music, jazz, blues, and of course, the music theater, coming from vaudeville, coming from operetta, actually, also from Europe. And why not have the quality that we can bring to music theater with a full orchestra and chorus and also present these pieces regionally because what I've discovered is that kids, we take it for granted to some degree, some of these classical pieces and kids don't know them. They're not familiar with them because the performance of them has been so tightly controlled for commercial reasons. So the other thing that can happen is that regional opera houses can pre pre present artistically aspirational music theater. In other words, music theater that's not commercial enough to be successful on Broadway. Sweeney Todd, for instance, has been very successful in opera houses. Something like Bridges Over Madison County, those kinds of pieces could successfully, I think, be performed in opera houses. Uh, and our audiences might enjoy having this variety. So Lyric currently has embarked on a five-year Rodgers and Hammerstein series. The idea is to get new people in the door for a great experience and encourage them to come back for the opera. The hills are alive with the sea. We loved it! It was amazing. It's really awesome. I'm just like short of like getting up and singing you know, along and it's, it's just lovely. There's a lot of movement between the different sets. They're very realistic. Yeah. It's amazing. I've got chills from almost every song. And to have it in the lyric opera with the acoustics and everything, it's, it's, it's really astonishing. I want to come back even while it's still here. I can't even talk. I'm going to start crying. It was fabulous. I've seen a lot of Broadway shows. This is one of the best productions of any show I've ever seen. Do a deer, a female deer. Ray, a drop of golden sun. Me, a name. I call myself Ba, a long, long way to makes me smile. I love this. So speaking of children, we want to get them in the house, but we also want to go out into the community and service them and help them. So Yo-Yo Ma and I have joined together with Mayor Rahm Emanuel and the Chicago Public Schools in an initiative to provide arts education, equal arts education, to all 400,000 students in the public school district. I know, it's so important. Because what was happening is you'd have one principal who was interested and a block away there would be another principal who didn't value it and those children would have nothing. So now it will be even. Now we're also bringing our star power to support teachers who are at this point volunteering their services. It's incredibly important. There are other programs. There's Career Day. We're inviting students in to see all of the jobs that are available in our huge institution. School partnering. We're trying to foster more appreciation of opera, and I'd like some great singers to be discovered as well by finding and connecting students with lyric opera who have an interest and talent um, in, from various charter and public schools. And I, it's, it's been a very extraordinary experience uh, partnering with these schools. There's so many gifted children out there. Um, now, what's coming up? Chicago Voices. I've always had a huge fascination with singing. 
and with an eclectic taste in music. So at the Kennedy Center, I brought together top singers from all different genre. We brought together music business members, pedagogues, leaders in medicine, leaders in the recording industry, and wonderful singers from these different genres. We discussed trends, how we're similar, how we're different. We coached young artists, we performed together, and we produced a documentary called American Voices. You take a breath and the breath comes out, which is really what it means to be alive. And on that breath can be um, a melody. Why do we sing? It's when words aren't enough. The only way to express this moment or a feeling is you have to sing. You are the instrument. There's nothing between you and the music. I'm going to turn my back on love. Singing is communicating, whether you're Bob Dylan or you're Mariah Carey, uh, you have to uh, tell a story. It's been too hard living. I've always been fascinated by all kinds of singing. The world has gone mad today, and good's bad today, and black's white today. Why does somebody's voice give us goosebumps? I'm all that's left of two hearts. Or make us cry immediately. And it got me thinking about what I had in common with other kinds of singers. So what I wanted to do with American Voices was bring together great singers and it's simply celebrate the richness, the tapestry, why the human voice is so powerful, why people are moved, what the expression is of each unique human being, how to unlock a new understanding of finding your own voice. That was amazing. Uh, it was on PBS. I, I hope it's still on the website if you're curious to see the documentary. My consultancy at Lyric was extended uh, in May, and a major new initiative will be to produce Chicago Voices, which will be broader. It will have a commissioning project in the community, a focus, of course, on Chicago's very rich vocal history, and bring artists into the Opera House who probably have never possibly even been in the Opera House before. So it may look as if we're inviting people into the temple of opera, but in fact, what we're saying is, please let us back in, because we have something to offer as well. We offer the history of singing, and we want to be included in the mainstream again. Finally, I believe that since the mainstay of our art form still hinges on the same repertoire that's been performed for 100 years, with variety coming basically from new productions, we can safely expand what we present while maintaining a core of high quality opera. Young generations are ahead of us. They're doing this already. They're performing contemporary classical music juxtaposed with bluegrass or blue reed. They're doing it in unconventional places with amplification. They're doing whatever they want to do, basically. The walls are down. I get to try this now by curating a series of concerts at Harris Theater, which is the gorgeous Frank Gehry designed um, theater in Millennium Park in Chicago, working with Michael Tickness to create a presenting with lyric opera series and will hopefully draw on an arts adventurous audience and people who are curious. And I'll begin, I'll be the first guinea pig by collaborating with a jazz great, someone who I really admire. Um, and we haven't announced it yet, so I won't say who it is. And back to celebrity power, I sang with Jane Lynch at the White House for the Christmas tree lighting, discovered she was from Chicago. This is what I do, by the way. I go around the world doing these events and say, innocently, where are you from? And when anybody says Chicago, I pounce. So, so I said, oh, 
oh, would you like to host our anniversary gala? And she said, oh, I'd love to. I'm coming home anyway. I said, great. She had such, <laughs> yes, and that's me and then one of the habits there, yes. So she had such a good time. She's coming back and bringing her cabaret show. I, it, it's called, C, I think, See Jane Sing. Is that right? Yeah. So it's this idea of bringing people in and then also developing the best possible singers. So I'm also advising the Ryan Opera Center, helping them, and the Ryan Opera Center is our young artist training program, because we need more stars. So helping them create a strategic plan, helping them come into the 21st century with financial planning, website planning, how to self-market, how to manage themselves really, because that structure has really faded to some degree. And, uh, and also working with them vocally, so uh, along with the other great coaches, drama and movement, and, and trying to shore up and support our young singers because so much is asked of them worldwide. All of these guests, non-classical programming and programming outside of the theater are making Lyric into a more vibrant, unpredictable, and service-oriented place. So, thank you very much. What's really impressed me is finding out that you have to come here every year and learn every year and improve your skills. I mean, I think what I suspect is that you're really running all of our organizations because <laughs> your level of knowledge and skill is nobody else can do it, right? It's so impressive, and I've loved being here. It's been a real privilege for me. I am so grateful that you allowed me to come and talk to you and not sing. Thank you so much. <laughs>taking questions. Does anybody have any questions? I think there might be another minute left. There's some microphones over here. Hello, my name is Benjamin Luzak and I'm from Omaha Performing Arts. And you oh, just great. recently, uh, yeah, you just recently finished up your first Broadway show. Yes. And I was wondering if you would tell us a little bit about your experience and uh, would you ever do Broadway again? Oh my gosh, it was so much fun and so hard. You know, the work ethic of those performers, and I discovered this in Mary Widow as, as well because the dancers were all from Broadway. Um, the amount of discipline and the degree to which you create a family because you're with everyone every day. We're, much, we're the hothouse flowers of performers because the voice is so fragile and we're unamplified. Um, so we can't, we, we just have to be very careful with the instrument. Uh, but I really love the experience, you know, and of course also the brutality of commercial theater because we closed in about two seconds. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't know if I would do it again. I mean, the joy for me, honestly, above all, besides fabulous colleagues, was making people laugh, and that's what I wanted to get out of it, and I did. Because I never, all I've ever done in my entire career in opera, for the most part, was make people die and cry. <laughs> so... So I, and I was a secret, I just secretly wanted people to laugh. So that was so much fun. Thank you for mentioning it. Any other questions? Hi, good afternoon, Ms. Fleming. Hi. I'm Tom Golden with Tulsa Opera in Tulsa, oh, Oklahoma. <laughs> um, it's not often I get to have a complete fangirl moment, so thank you for being here this afternoon. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Super. My question is about American opera. You've created a number of roles and, and sang, sang even more, even uh, a large number of roles. Um, all of us want to see the art form grow and, and appreciate new works. Um, but for those of us in smaller cities, that can be a big challenge at the box office. So I wanted to just pick your brain a little bit about how you might make that connection in a community that might not have as big of a, an audience for opera. You know, honestly, uh, I, I wish every opera company had a, a few different venues to choose from because there's no question that there would be a smaller uh, audience for a lot of the things we would like to present, but there would be an audience for sure. And even if it's a workshop or a black box or something like that, um, I think new works absolutely should be tried out. Um, people love the idea of a premiere. They like the idea to see something 
for the first time. I think it's been extremely challenging for American composers because there's been a transition in terms of style. You know, we went from a very sort of neo-romantic Americana style um, that, was that was quite popular. And then uh, we've had a sort of post-minimalism style that's been very popular from John Adams on. And now, um, it, it, you know, it's it, what's, what is hard is something that's kind of academic sounding or really just too challenging for the audience. Now, my favorite situation is Beth Morrison Projects, the Prototype Festival in New York because she presents five or six new works. They're very small. They're very, uh, each of them kind of black box and all quite different. She curates them herself. And if you're, you're seeing them all, it becomes a festival. And then you draw people who really are curious. So that can be a quite interesting thing to look at and try. I would suggest you go check it out. And the website is great too. I'm a big fan. Um, but do it, absolutely try it. I mean, Philadelphia Opera, and Anna's here, I think. She's, I mean, th that company is doing really interesting work and, and doing very well. Um, but I think it, it needs to be modern and adventurous more than, more than reactionary, um, in my opinion. Uh, that's, I think that's what uh, works better. So, uh, okay, I just put myself out on a limb there, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Do whatever you think is best. You know your audience better. <laughs> See? Back to the programming quandary. <laughs> All right, next. Hi, I'm Lisa McColgan. I'm uh, from the Huntington Theatre Company in Boston. Great. And um, speaking as probably a lot of us who are in arts administration, um, and for myself particularly, as an artist who found myself quite accidentally in fundraising, um, I, I've learned that I've had to be sort of become bilingual um, going out into the communities, the corporate communities, mm -hmm. and speaking their language and, you know, finding ways to translate the importance of what I do from what I know as an artist to, and, and trying to express the importance of that to someone who maybe doesn't have an arts background. And I was wondering if you could um, speak a little bit about your experience with that, if you found it challenging to sort of um, go out there as an artist um, talking to corporations and, and finance leaders. Well, I haven't had that uh, position per se, but I'm wanting to make that argument for society as a whole. There's no question I'm beginning to focus on that question. And it's the, the, the I do believe that culture in general and certainly the classical arts are not as valued as they should be by our culture. And, uh, and we need to make a very strong case for it and a loud case for it. So one of the things I'm looking at is a project around um, medicine uh, and health, well-being and the arts. You know, whether it's movement, and there's a ton of research now being done around music, um, whether it's autism, Alzheimer's, or just, you know, there was an, there's an article almost every day in the paper, and now this one was about post-op and, you know, how music really can help you heal. So these are the things, I mean, but we have to make a big message because there's so much noise out there in terms of the amount of information all of us are ingesting on a daily basis that if we don't make a big noise, somehow together and say, listen, this is important. The other one, of course, is childhood development, is, is really is the arts in schools. It's absolutely been proven that kids don't stay in school if they don't have an imperative, a real reason, an interest, whatever that interest is, and a lot of times it is creativity, it is the arts. So we see it succeeding, we just have to point to those messages, definitely, and make them powerful. And finally, it's the thing I spoke of, it's that sense of community. It's community building. But uh, it, it's figuring out what your message is and making it strong. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. That is, that is so much pressure right now. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Ms. Fleming. My name's Tiffany Evans, or now it's Elliot because I just got married. But oh, I... <laughs> congratulations! Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I also work at the Huntington Theater Company in Boston, Massachusetts, and uh, former opera singer. So oh. it's a huge pleasure to finally meet you in flip flops oh, and blue jeans. <laughs> um, but um, 
My question has to do with uh, digital streaming. Since you were a part of Aha. the big boom with performing live in front of yes. really hundreds of thousands of people, do you think that helps or do you think that that hurts outreach efforts? Uh, I think it's inevitable and important because it will enable us to be, it, it, all of our entertainment is going to be 24-7 at some point in the future. And people are going to be able to see whatever they want at any time of day and why wouldn't we want to be part of that? Um, as long as it's quality and as long as we can benefit from it, um, I think it's, and, and as long as people understand, I mean certainly the human voice, gosh I remember when I was First of all, I have learned so much from having YouTube, from having archival um, uh, sound recording sites. Uh, I do all of my programming on iTunes. I mean, so I couldn't live without it now. And of course I did for most of my career. So uh, that's an important resource for me. But there is no substitute for hearing the human voice unamplified in a hall. It's not the same. It, you know, what happens to the overtones in the hall is what makes the magic. So, um, so that's an important point to continue to make. And the same is true about the theatrical experience because you're, you're sitting next to somebody and you're sighing together, you're taking your breath together, you're wiping your eyes together. So, but, it, but still, people will gravitate towards what they want, which is access. Um, uh, but so I think it's it's going to happen. Okay. Thank you. It should happen. Renee. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Very on behalf much. of the entire Tessitura <laughs> community, thank you for your shared passion for arts and culture. Oh, thank, thank you, you for being much. here to inspire us, it's and thank pleasure. you for shining sunshine on the world of Tessitura. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it was great. Thank you, everybody.